Our scripture reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 11, from verse 23 to 30. At the servants of Christ, I am a better one. I am talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less worn. Three times I was beaten with runs. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys. In danger from rivers. In danger from robbers. Danger from my own people. Danger from Gentiles. Danger in the city. Danger in the wilderness. Danger at sea. Danger from false brothers. In toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there's the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak and I am not weak? who is made to fall, and I am not indignant. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. God bless the reading of his word. Dr. James Singleton has been teaching here at Gordon-Conwell for 10 years, which I believe is the longest you've worked anywhere ever before. (laughs) Just looking through here, he was the pastor, uh, youth pastor, I believe, at First Presbyterian Church in San Antonio, at Whitworth Community Church, which is where we first met, at Covenant Presbyterian Church in Austin, Texas, First Presbyterian Church, Colorado Springs, and then 10 years here. Great pastoral experience around the country, He did his undergraduate degree at Rhodes College and then an MDiv split between Gordon Conwell and Union. And I think that has something to do with the requirements of the Presbyterian Church at that time. And then a PhD here in Boston at Boston University. And he told me today this is not his actual robe. That's right, so do you have one? Well, we'll leave that. (laughs) We'll leave that. (laughs) But I would like to make just two or three quick comments about Jim. It's one of the, another sad moment that he's graduating this year. He's moving on with you folks, uh, moving back to the West Coast. He is known for at least three very important characteristics. Number one, he's concerned about evangelism. His doctoral dissertation was about evangelism and how we can maintain that kind of evangelistic zeal in our churches today in pastoral ministry. Number two, he cares deeply about discipleship. Not that we just convert people or bring people to a point of a decision, but that people grow in Christ. And he shows that by his commitment to discipleship among students as well as in the churches. And then he's very committed to renewal in churches, to see churches renewed and pastors taken care of in churches. He works today with Leighton Ford Ministries, helping pastors in ministry today. He's also known for scaring people whenever they go around the corners. But that's another story. It has something deep to do with his psychological condition. (laughs) But I count Jim as a great friend and a great supporter of the church. He's been a great model for our students. And I want to thank you, Jim, for all the work you've done for us. Thank you for those kind words, Scott. Um, As I look out on this congregation, I'm just aware we need to do one little thing. There is too much wood in between me and you in the back. So could you just stand up a minute, come closer? Yeah, it's time to come closer. These students are, are alone. Come on, up, 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 up. You're way too far, way too far. Come on, come on. Fill in, fill in. The students need you right behind them for a couple of reasons, but they need you closer. Thank you, thank you. It's kind of like intermission, uh, except you're coming forward instead of going out, but thank you, thank you. I see that hand, I see that hand. Uh, Perfect. Now they feel closer, we all feel closer. 
as you're coming, I simply want to say I'm deeply grateful for the reading of grateful of that fabulous and haunting passage about suffering. I'm thankful for this invitation to speak to you who are almost graduates. Got one more day and then you are. Uh, and I'm honored to speak for the final time to my wonderful colleagues behind me. This is a treasured group of folks. They have put up with a lot in me uh, and I, I've scared them too. Uh, do I hear an amen? Uh, and so I'm just very grateful and for the trustees, Thank you for your shepherding, your fiduciary roles, your visioning roles. Thank you very much. Now let's be clear. This is a baccalaureate sermon. They are not normally memorable. It's just the way they are. I mean, I've been to about 20 of these uh, and some of my colleagues have preached and they've really been good, but I, to tell you the truth, I can't remember what it was about tonight. I remember, I, I remember one, by Haddon Robinson, and I sat way back there, and it was on ants, and I, I don't know what he said about ants, but the whole sermon was from Proverbs about ants. I do remember one sermon I preached in 2014, and I don't remember it because it was memorable. I remember it because I was scared to death, and fear will do all kinds of things to your memory. It will sear things in that otherwise would have gone. I preached that night with what I thought was a decent image that of a turtle on a fence post. It was provided for us by Alan Emery, who was a longtime trustee of Gordon Conwell. He wrote a little book by that name, and he said, if you ever see a turtle on a fence post, you know it didn't get there by itself. <laughs> there were a lot of people that helped, and so I preached that night about all of you that are just real close, that you are the people who put the turtle on the fence post. And, and that means spouses and parents and friends and children, etc., that got you to the, what I call the graduation fence post. Not a bad reminder even for this year, but the people who heard the sermon, they kind of messed up the sermon. It got to be regularly referred to me. Uh, Jim, we thank you for the sermon about the frog on the fence post. You hate to correct people's theology at that point, but, but a frog, you see, messes up the illustration because theoretically a frog could get up on a fence post by itself. And, and only a turtle could get there with a lot of help. And so I'd want to say, you know, actually it wasn't a frog. Uh, it was, well, it, you just, you know, you just say thank you, finally. <laughs> and then one of the dear people who is, bless her heart, an animal rights activist just did, kind of took me to task because I talked about a turtle being what would have been traumatized because a turtle really doesn't want to be on a fence post and didn't like the image because of that and said, you know, only mean 11-year-old boys would have done that and wondered if I had been a mean 11-year-old boy. <laughs> so I decided tonight I'm not going to give you an image. I'm not going to give you a metaphor. I'm going to give you just two words from the scripture and one of those words is surprise. Let's all say that word together, surprise. In fact, would you turn to your neighbor and go, surprise. <laughs> see, that's what I wanted to see. I love that. Ellie, thank you for doing that. That was good. Okay, now the other word is rejoice, and that's a delightful biblical word. So let me read one more passage, just two verses. It comes from 1 Peter chapter 2. Chapter 4, verse 12 and 13. Dear friends, dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Let's pray. Lord, would you open your word to us in such a way that we can understand what it is we're about to step into when we leave Gordon Conwell as graduates. And for all of those who are watching and cheering and proud and thankful behind them tonight, 
we're entering the same kind of world. What is it going to be like? Help us to see, Lord. Amen. All of you have gathered from so many different places and contexts, what unites us tonight is a mutual appreciation for these almost graduates who have come from across the country, around the globe, regularly fought New England traffic to get here, or spent hours on Zoom, more hours than they ever imagined. If you were a student here the last three years, each of those three years has been impacted by COVID. These graduates have adapted to classes online, meals in isolation, and masks galore. How many masks have you gotten? (laughs) I'm ready to just sort of get rid of them. I'm done with masks. Okay. Um, It's been a tough season. And this very semester, so many have been felled again. Some are not seated around you tonight because they've got it right now. Should be noted that three students, all in our Latino and Global Ministries program, died of COVID. Nellie Jameson from New Jersey, Eduardo Vega from Mexico, John Newsom in Kansas. No class, no graduating class in memory has had to experience the sheer agility of this graduating class. This spring, you even had to adapt to the academic center in Hamilton on fire (laughs) and unusable. And trying the turtle on the fence post one more time. There have been a lot of people here doing a lot of agility, agility drills with you to get you to this point. A president, several deans, tech services, food services, the dean of students, the director of housing, the cleaning staff, the financial folks, and even the founder of Zoom. (laughs) But the question I want to ask you is, after graduation tomorrow, is your life about to return to normal? Do you get to settle into predictable routines and return to the life of stability? Well, the congregations and the ministries we now join provide us with calm after the storm. Not to mention this war in Ukraine, political anger, racial crisis, gas prices, housing inflation, and further variants of COVID. When they settle down, will they all settle down now that you're graduating? The hoped for answer is yes. Stability and calm, the real answer is surprise. So Peter writes, do not be surprised at the painful trials you are suffering. Don't be surprised. Surprises come in all kinds of ways that do not include COVID. Surprise breakups of relationships, surprise health issues, surprise bills in the mail, surprise visa denials, surprising friends who abandon you, Surprise church members who decide to leave the church. But Peter is actually urging us not to be surprised by trials and sufferings. When I suffer, I'm still in surprise. Is anybody with me? I still get surprised by this. When I came to Christ 50 years ago this summer, there was a very popular Coca-Cola slogan. Things go better with Coke. That was modified by the very first generation of Christian t-shirts. They stole the Coke logo and put on it, things go better with Christ. Brilliant. I want it. I want that. I came to Christ for salvation from my sin, but also because I had bad acne, no prospects for a girlfriend, and was third string in every sport. And I wanted it to get better. The acne stayed, the girlfriend situation improved slightly, but only enough for me to then get dumped, which was worse than not having one. Athletic prowess remains hidden, but it's coming. Uh, I I was surprised by the Christian life not making everything better and settled. And you know, as a pastor for about 30 years, 
there's been suffering. I've had to manage budget cuts with dear people laid off, building projects with cost overruns that we hadn't raised the money for, divorces by key staff member, illegal behavior by my elders who went to jail, adulterous affairs by staff members, dozens of angry emails from church members reminding me that I was ruining their church. I've done funerals for suicides, murders, stillborn babies. I faced broken hearts in ministry and burned out emotions. And this included the suffering from all the stupid mistakes I made as a pastor. And my life never got anywhere near what Peter was talking about in the first century suffering of believers in Asia Minor, nor the suffering of Christians in India, China, Nepal, Part of me wants to apologize for the past three years of weird adjustments, but actually it's going to be a great preparation for what's ahead. Peter is urging us not to regard it as strange when we suffer in ministry. Now, nothing in the text urges us to invent suffering or look for suffering or suffer by being obnoxious or insensitive, but ministry and life brings tons of surprising suffering. My mother had quite a series of surprises. From young adult age on, she had debilitating rheumatoid arthritis. She had 27 major surgeries on nearly every joint in her body. She had artificial hips in the first group that ever got them when they were a brand new procedure. After the birth of my two older sisters, my mother had five surprising miscarriages and one surprising stillbirth. And then with gnarled hands and painful shoulders, she gave surprising birth to me when she was 42 years old. She earned a master's degree in Christian education in 1938 when nobody did. And she was one of the most powerful Bible teachers I have ever known. She rarely missed a Sunday of teaching God's word, even with all her pain, because she delighted in helping people get to know this book. And as a teenager, I would often go to bed hearing her crying in pain at night, hoping for the morning. And I did not understand why that surprising suffering would happen to a godly person. Our dear president likes to drive home a certain mantra with us. It works well with academics. No secrets, no surprises, no subversion. I want to counter, Scott. Could we just do two out of three? Because surprises are part of the ministry that we are urged not to be surprised by. But there's a second word, and that's the word rejoice. That's a verb. To choose to rejoice is not normal. Normal is whining, it's complaining, it's grumbling. Can we all kind of have a joint? That's kind of how the word for grumbling sounds in Greek. Um, Paul said the same thing in Acts 14.22, which has not been until yesterday on a single refrigerator magnet until Esther put it on one, but we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. That's part of the word. He said that upon re-entry to a place where he had just been stoned so that he can encourage believers. Realize that rejoicing is a choice. It's not an emotion. The feeling of happiness is what comes when our team wins, when we get a raise, when we get an A on the exam. Rejoicing is different. It's found with a nevertheless in this sentence. Rejoice is the kind of decision that Habakkuk makes, though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vine, and though the olive crop fails and the field produces no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. How on earth do we rejoice in suffering? Well, first, spiritually and psychologically, in suffering, we have to lament. 
we have to grieve. The dream we had is not going to find fulfillment in the way we dreamed it. And with all the changes in ministry as you are alive now and that will be changing as we live in an increasingly secular society, there are lots of dreams that are not going to quite happen the way we planned it. But secondly, we adjust our expectations and we remember that God's plan is better than my plan. And that's really hard for the arrogant to come to grips with. Manna and quail are okay for dinner. I didn't really like leeks and garlics anyway. I'm all right. James says, go ahead and count it all joy when you face suffering, which means he's putting it in the column of joy. Third, I can dare to rejoice because I know ministry is also going to provide some amazing events. Along with suffering, I get to see conversions I never saw coming. And they are glorious. Marriages restored, deep wounds healed, buildings dedicated, budgets that grow, people called into ministry, sometimes even late in life like Ed Jordan. And you get to see these things and you go, wow, this is glorious material. One surprise is that there is suffering in ministry. The other surprise is the joy. I think that's why C.S. Lewis called his conversion story surprised by joy. See, I think Abraham understood suffering and rejoicing. Leave your land, your people, your father's house. Go to the land that I will show you. But the journey was tough. There was famine in the land that he had to go to. He was surprised by joy. A few weeks ago, I preached on Joseph. He understands suffering and rejoicing. Moses understands suffering and rejoicing. 40 years with whiny, complaining people. You would think he worked in a seminary. I mean, that's amazing. Uh, the job was surprisingly harder than what he knew. And it turned out that getting people out of Egypt was the easy part. Getting Egypt out of them was the hard part. Somebody else said that. But there was joy. We read through Hebrews 11 and you just keep seeing that pattern. And it concludes with none of them received what was promised, but they greeted it from afar. Peter got this in his early baccalaureate sermon that Jesus preached to him on the beach, which included equal parts, feed my sheep and tend my lambs. And it ended with, and somebody else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. As I get older, I'm not excited about that one. I just don't know. And Paul, of course, might be in first place in terms of suffering. And you heard what Grateful read. Worked harder, prison more frequently, flogged more severely, exposed to death again and again. Five times 39 lashes, my three times beaten with rods, once stoned, three times shipwrecked, a day and a night in sea, constantly on the move, danger from rivers, danger from bandits, danger from Gentiles, in the city, in the country, at sea, false brethren, labored toil, gone without sleep, hunger and thirst without food, cold and naked, daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. And yet it's the same Paul who writes, rejoice, rejoice in the Lord Always, and again, I will say, rejoice. So then the last phrase from Peter. So that you may be overjoyed at God's revelation. So that you may be overjoyed. Now see, the first one is a decision you make. I'm going to rejoice. This one is passive. And this one is subjunctive and passive. So it might happen. It may happen, but it's going to happen to you when now that joy of the Holy Spirit starts welling up. You see, Christian joy is different than a feeling. It's expressed in a feeling, but it's deeper than a feeling. It's something untouchable. It's like knowing a secret. It's, it's a deep gladness. It's a delight. It's some, there's something about joy that is beyond the rise and fall of our fame and fortune. Joy is a reservoir in our hearts 
a river that never ceases to flow. It's the fruit of the reality of the Holy Spirit and it has to do with a sure hope about a certain future upon receiving salvation. You know the whole gospel story now. You know where we're going. And that can change every day in the middle of a circumstance. It was an October Saturday afternoon. 1982, Camp Randall Stadium, Madison, Wisconsin. 60,000 people were gathered watching the Wisconsin Badgers playing the Michigan State Spartans. It was going badly for the Badgers. They would eventually lose by 35 points. What seemed odd though was that as the, story, as the score became more and more lopsided, there were these bursts of applause and shouts of delight from Wisconsin fans. And people were going, what is going on? It was crazy. How could they cheer when their team was losing? Well, as it turned out, 70 miles away, game three of the 1982 World Series was going on. The Milwaukee Brewers were beating the St. Louis Cardinals. And many of the Wisconsin fans in the stands had something that you all have never seen. It's called a portable transistor radio. And you held on to it and put a little bud in your ear and you're watching the game, but you're listening to another story. Mmm. I'm about to preach, Claude. I'm about to preach. You see, their delight was in something other than what was seen on the field because the baseball game was very real, just not visible. On the field, one story was happening, but another story was happening in your earbud. You see, rejoicing is like that. Something can be happening in your life, not good. But there's another story. There is another story. And that one is gonna bring joy to your heart. And it comes from the reality of another world breaking in on ours. And you live in this world chasing after joy, but you live in another world where God's revelation is crashing into this world in the kingdom of God. Mmm, mmm, that'll do it. My mother died in the summer of 1981 at age 66. I had just finished my first year here. She was not present two years later when I graduated or the month that I was ordained. And if this old turtle ever got on a fence post, she was the reason why. She powerfully loved Jesus in the midst of all kinds of suffering that finally on this earth, I can't say it's squared. I wished a stadium full of people would have been converted, but we didn't. I, you just have to say there's another story that she was listening to and that I was listening to. She used to tell me that if we had understood scripture differently in 1938, she would have become the pastor preacher. And so to every young female graduate tonight that I've taught, or part of the joy I have in seeing you is that you're carrying on a piece of my mother's dream. Mm. And, and as a young woman, my mother loved to dance. But with her arthritis, that was lost. But she wrote many times about how overjoyed she was going to be because she anticipated dancing before the Lord in the resurrection. You see, every night as she cried in pain, she knew there was another story going on. And she lived for Revelation 21, 3 and 4. The dwelling of God is with men and he'll be with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying and pain for the old order of things has passed away. So you will get through the suffering of this life and the suffering that goes with ministry and all of the ways it manifests itself. 
Because you hear a different story playing in your ears. The story of the revealing of God in this world. And it's worth all the surprises and all the heartaches and all the pain. And sometimes you can't hear the story alone. And you need somebody to help you hear it. Look around you. Look at the folks on your row. Look at them. Look at them. Look at the choir. If you ever see a suffering Christian rejoicing, you know they didn't get there alone. Amen.